All right. Welcome, you guys. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and kick off with our uh, video, and then you'll hear from our director, DJ Harrell. Welcome to City Hall, the new home of Development Services, located at 100 Fort Worth Trail. Let's go inside and check out the new customer center on the fifth floor. The fifth floor is your one-stop shop that centralizes all of your development needs. Let me show you our new and improved process to make it easier for customers needing assistance with development or permit related questions. First, go to one of our kiosks and select what you're here for. Then wait in the lobby for a text message that will direct you to the fifth floor. Now that you've been notified to come to the fifth floor, you wanna to come to the waiting area where you'll get a final notification to go to an appropriate window to be helped by a development support specialist. The customer center here on the fifth floor was designed to simplify the development review and consultation process we look forward to seeing you here at New City Hall. Just so you know, they call me the Brad Pitt of City Hall. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. I just wanted to stand up and welcome you guys to, to our New City Hall. These are our new digs. We're happy to host you guys here. This is our, our third in the series of Development 101, where we, um, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, maybe I should introduce myself. I'm DJ Harrell, and I'm Director of Development Services for the City of Fort Worth. Uh, here at the City of Fort Worth, we believe in being partners with our development community and our business owners. Uh, we want to make sure we understand that developing property in the city is a very difficult process at times. So we want to partner in making sure that you guys know how to navigate the development process that we've laid out in the City of Fort Worth. So we've got Lori Lewis there, who you'll hear from soon, who's got a great team and staff, uh, uh, several staff members that'll you know, walk you through the development process today to kind of talk through di a different scenario. Um, today, I think we're doing, is it Bob's Bistro? Yes. Bob's Bistro. So Bob's gonna develop in the city of Fort Worth and it's gonna, we're gonna walk through the entire process. There'll be breakout sessions, it's gonna be really fun. So I, again, wanna welcome you guys. Uh, if you haven't, please take an opportunity to kind of walk around City Hall, uh, get to know your way around, uh, you know, meet staff. Again, we wanna be partners, we wanna know you, we want you to know us, we wanna give you our personal contact information so that we can uh, be here for you whenever you need to reach out. Again, thank you guys, and I'll turn it over to Lori. Awesome. All right, good afternoon. I am Lori Lewis. I work in development services for the city of Fort Worth. And thank you so much for being with us today. So we have a couple of things that we want to cover today. Um, first, let me say a quick thank you to everybody that helped put this event uh, together. There were, it's, it takes a village for sure. So our partners, the Real Estate Council, Greater Fort Worth, the DAC, our Development Advisory Committee, and then our Alliance Partners. Okay, so, oh, I need that, right? So I think some of you were able to join one of our tours to introduce you to the fifth floor uh, customer center. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that, it was informative. We will offer two more later today. So if you missed it initially, you can stick around till four Feel free to just hang out in the lobby and we'll have two more tours. All right, let's do some housekeeping and I will start with the new fee schedule. So just a heads up, the city is implementing new fees that will go into effect on tomorrow, October 1st. So I want to give you a heads up that that's happening. This is a QR code that will bring you to the fees that, so that you can get an idea of what those new fees look like. So we do have a survey, and let me take a moment to talk about the survey. So the survey is very important to us. Of course, we wanna know how we can improve. What can we do better? What's working, what's not working? Secondly, we have committed to the community to offer one of these workshops once a quarter next year. So we'll be offering four workshops next year. We would like to know, what do you wanna, what, do you, what would you like to see? Let us know, a specific department, a process, share your ideas. And uh, we'll definitely be looking at that so that we can make some decisions for next year. You'll see this QR code here, the presentation. 
I have it posted everywhere because I'm really trying to encourage you guys to take it. So you'll see it on the doors and in your breakout sessions. Okay, so let's go for the, over the agenda. I want to make sure that you understand the flow of today and this afternoon. So first, I would like to walk you through the learning objectives for today and then an overview of the breakout sessions. I want to introduce you to our development, Bob's Bistro. And then I'll walk you through steps, resources that we offer that uh, when a developer is getting started with their development, what can they leverage that the city offers to get started? We'll take a 15 minute break. Feel free to take snacks, drinks, and then you'll go to your breakout session. Uh, there's three of them today and I'll walk you through where you'll go after this introduction. And then don't forget the tour is starting at four. Okay, so what are we going to learn today? So, what we're hoping that you get out of today's uh, workshop is, I wanna make sure that you guys have a better understanding of our development process. Uh, did I go too far? Yeah. Okay, so that you walk away having a better idea of what the process looks like. So if you're new to it, it can be daunting. There's all these steps all these departments, what does it mean? So after today, hopefully you'll have a better idea of what needs to be done. And that's not, once you do understand, it's not really that hard of a process. And of course, the city is always here to assist. I wanna introduce you to the tools and the resources available on our website. And then finally, when you go to your breakout sessions, the goal is for you to meet city staff. So these are the experts for their field, right? zoning, IPRC, platting. So I encourage you to get to know our folks, have conversations, go up to them, ask questions, and perhaps you've talked to them in the past. Today, you'll be able to put a face with a name. Okay. So this is a breakout. This reflects our breakout sessions for today. So they're going to run concurrent. So each one will be starting at around 2.45. And there's three. And the way we broke it out is each session you can think of as a phase of our development process. So the first phase, you, you have to get your entitlements in order, right? What is your zoning? Is that in place? Do you have to make a zoning change? So the first session is going to cover zoning, urban design, and then urban forestry. We threw urban forestry in there because before you start your design, you really need to care for trees, right? Or what ur uh, urban forestry requires. So that's why we're putting it in zoning because that's like the first phase. So let's just make sure that we understand what's required. Uh, the next uh, session is platting and infrastructure. So you can think about that as the second phase of the development process, right? You got your zoning entitlements, all that's good to go. So let's move forward with our uh, design and our civil plans. So we have studies that are required. We have uh, platting our civil plans, IPRC, and any contracts. We also have a new program that we're going to introduce you to. Perhaps you've already heard about it, but that would be the small scale infrastructure program. So you'll hear about that in the second session. Finally, the third session is permits. So this is the final phase of the development process, right? Zoning's taken care of, you have civil plans, you have your contracts, now you're ready to go vertical. What permits do you need to do so? So we're gonna talk about building permits, plan review, and all of the other permits that would be required to ensure you can start construction. So that's how you can think about the breakout sessions. I realize that they're running concurrent, and perhaps you're signed up for zoning, but boy, you sure would like to know what permits had to say, right? We're recording all of the sessions, so we will be sending that out after today's uh, workshop. So then you can look at the video and learn more. Okay. So let's meet our fictional development, which is Bob is building a bistro. So Bob is realizing his dream. You know, mine is the lottery, but for Bob, it is the bistro. And he is finally ready to move forward. So he did some initial research, and there's some things we know about his property as well as the scope of work. So we're starting off here. 
We know that the property is in Southwest Fort Worth. It's a greenfield site, never been developed. He believes it's zoned for mixed use. The property is 2.0 acres, and there are several large caliper trees on the site. So that's important, right? That's when you're gonna to talk to urban forestry and find out, well, what do I need to do? Can I knock them down? You know, can I get rid of them? I, I venture to say they're not gonna be happy about that. So you'll talk to them and find out what the requirements are. And then, um, so this is new construction. And so you can see Bob's, Bob's got a lot going on. He's not just doing his bistro, but he also has a vacant space next door, the bistro 10,000 square feet, next door the vacant space 10,000 square feet, and then above on the second level is a multifamily, 25 units, 20,000 square feet. So this is what Bob's vision is. So knowing this, what else can Bob do? He can get started with due diligence, right? What can he do on his own to find out more information about his property, the site, and then his use? So the first thing Bob can do is more research. He can go to our website, Development Services. He can, sorry, I'm not used to a mic. Um, he can go to Development Services and that's where he's gonna find all of the resources needed um, and that are available to develop in the city of Fort Worth. Just know we're sending out this presentation in this video. So don't worry about taking too many notes. Uh, the second thing that he can do is he can go to our new portal, Business Services which is located on the home page of our website. So this is new and it's geared towards small business owners. So it has a lot of resources for that niche, right? Uh, how to register with the Secretary of State, how to write a business plan, are there funding opportunities for this small business? We also have guides that are located on this site, one of them being a guide that will walk you through the Fort Worth process for the Certificate of Occupancy Guide for restaurants. So this is a great place for Bob to also explore. What else can Bob do? We have tools, we have really good tools. And I think that we don't advertise them enough so that folks know it's out there to get the information they need. So one of them being City of Fort Worth CFW Permit Assist. And I'll walk you through that in just a moment. Another tool we have is one address. So I like one address. I like it because it's simple and it gives me a lot of information. So it can be accessed from our home page. You enter the address of your site and it's gonna pull up a lot of good information about that site. The neighborhood, uh, you can find out what the council district is, who the council member is, what the zoning is going on in there, any crime statistics. But you can also find out uh, about our traffic impact fees. So traffic impact fees have a service area and we're gonna cover that in the permits uh, breakout session. But this is one place you can find out what your service area is. So we also have zoning and annexation viewer. So this just gives information, it's like a map, you can pull up zoning cases, annexation cases, uh, the zoning in different parts of the city. So that's another good tool. And then we have our flood risk viewer. So the flood risk viewer is just, it's a, it's a resource that developers can look at to understand, is that a flood risk area? You know, is that a flood plain? So it kind of gives that kind of information as you, and it's something for you to look at, right? If you're looking at a particular site, you want to know, you know, is that going to be an issue? Cause that makes it much harder. Okay. Let's talk about CFW permit assist. So this is an interactive tool. And it also is connected to our permitting system, Acela ACA. So the good thing about this tool is you can enter certain information about your site and it will spit out what is required. What permits are required? Is that zoning or use allowed? Is the use allowed in the zoning? It will also give you an estimate of fees. So it's another good way to begin as you start your development because, you know, we're looking at project plans, we're looking at budget, things like that. So it's a good initial view of what that would look like based on what you input into the tool. So Bob decided to use this tool. And when he entered his address, answered the questions, he was able to find out that site is actually zoned agriculture. 
not zoned for restaurant, not zoned for multifamily. So now Bob knows, hey, I have to rezone. So that's some information that he gathered just by using this tool. Let's talk about guides and manuals. So of course, Bob's not gonna do this all on his own. We don't not encourage that, right? We don't want Bob designing civil plans and going doing all of that work. He's gonna have a team. He's gonna have a certified engineer that's gonna help with those plans. He's gonna have an architect. So this team of his is going to need information. And that's what these resources are all about. We have a commercial development guide. I encourage you to take a look. It is multiple pages, but it gives a lot of good information about what the steps are, what the departments handle, what is the time frame? Is it a five day turnaround? Is it a 14 day turnaround? So it'll give you that information as well as an estimation on fees. So again, building that project plan, understanding how long it's gonna take in the, in the budget. So Bob is going to have his engineer who's gonna help him with his plans. And that's where these criteria manuals kick in. So we encourage Bob and his design team to use the stormwater criteria manual, transportation engineering criteria manual, and our water wastewater criteria manual. And so there's a code here that will bring you to our development guide. What else can Bob's design team leverage? He can also leverage our public information request uh, for the as-built drawings for existing infrastructure. So that's good information too, is what's out there. Um, you know, instead of going in there blindly, I encourage Bob and his team to leverage this to understand what is already, you know, underground. All right, and another thing that he can do is a pre-development conference. So let's talk about a pre-development conference. So Bob has learned that the city offers a conference with city staff who re will review his site plan and provide comments on that site plan and talk about what's required, what are the risks, what information does he need to go forward. So that would be, um, we encourage Bob and his design team to join so that they can hear the information all at once. Also, they can ask questions. So uh, the meeting is optional but we highly encourage this as your first step because at least you're hearing from staff on exactly what you need based on the site plan that was provided. Let me talk about site plans. We're not, we're not very picky on what that site plan looks like and we've seen them all. And we're not going to reject it. We're not gonna tell you no, you can't have a PDC because we don't like your site plan. We're willing to talk to you with whatever information you have. But let's think about it an undetailed site plan versus detailed. The more work you put into your site plan, provide it to the city, the better comments you're going to receive from staff. So really, it behooves you to try to put in those details so that you're just one step ahead hearing from the city with those details. It gives you more accurate information. Okay. So you're meeting with our city subject matter experts. In this grid here, this chart tells you who attends. Subdivision is platting, we have zoning, we have stormwater, fire. All the key players in the development process will join the PDC. Will, you'll send your site plan in two to four weeks early, they'll review it, and then you'll attend your PDC and hear your comments. Bob likes this option. He decides to move forward with this PDC. So a little more on PDCs. How do you schedule a PDC? You go to our website. You can put in the search engine pre-development conference. It's going to bring you directly to our page. You click a link, answer a few questions, submit your site plan, and send it off to actually my team, Facilitation. They are the ones that coordinate the PDCs as well as facilitate. We will receive your application, we'll give you a call, find out what dates work for you, and we'll go ahead and schedule. We offer PDCs three times a week, on Mondays, one to two, Tuesdays, three to four, and then on Thursdays, that's our big day. So between, it's, it's a block of time, nine through 12. PDCs, 30 minutes, free, no charge. We do offer a one hour more of a deep dive on that site plan. Uh, and there is a fee 
as of tomorrow with our new fees. I know it seems a little wonky, but it's 281.25. <laughs> so how does the meeting work? So they're virtual. It's done through WebEx. Uh, we encourage not just Bob, but his design team to join. And then what happens here is he has his site plan, he hears the comments, and now he can take those comments and revise that site plan and have a better site plan to move forward. So that's the goal. All right, so what did Bob learn? He had his PDC, and these, this is the information that he learned from that session. So he knows that he's not within a gas well pad site. It is in an active transportation impact fee area, and we'll talk more about that in the permit uh, breakout session. He is not in a special uh, zoning overlay district. He knows that, and he had initial conversations on how to go about that zoning change, right? It's agriculture and he's gonna have to go to restaurant multifamily. He knows from platting that he needs a minor final plat and he knows he's going to need to submit studies for review and approval before he can move forward. He knows a grading permit and an urban forestry permit are required and then that the building needs a fire sprinkler system. So Bob has done his due diligence. He has additional information, and this is where we're gonna stop. So now I've laid the foundation for you to move on to your breakout sessions. So what's next is we're gonna take a break. I might've talked fast. We wanna get started at 2.45, and these are the breakout sessions once again. So zoning is going to be to the conference room to the right. We did put a sign so you'll know that that's the zoning uh, breakout session. The platting infrastructure will be in this room. And then permits is going to be on this end. Again, there's a sign. Uh, don't forget we have tours from 4 to 4.30. So we're going to take a break. Bathrooms are on the opposite end of this floor. We have snacks, we have water, feel free. Uh, to take a break, stretch, and then we'll get started at 2.45. So let me, um, I think I got through it all. Any questions? Yeah. Um, how frequently are all the time slots for the pre-development conferences filled? You know, it and varies. How often would you have to, I guess it, it varies. Like a lead time? Right. To, re to schedule? Right. Three to four weeks, but right now, you know, it just, it's not consistent, to be it's honest with you. Like yeah, yeah. So, and I can't tell you what that trend is, but right now, two weeks. So uh, it just really depends. We do post the date that we are accepting PDCs. You can go to the PDC website and you'll see the date. So you'll have an idea where we are in the schedule. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you need to own the property? You can be evaluating. We get that a lot. Yeah, we do. Any other questions? None? I think a lot of y'all are probably familiar with that process. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Again, we appreciate your, your engagement, your participation, and supporting the city of Fort Worth. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm excited to have you here today for Development 101. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jennifer Azernak. I work in project facilitation. Ignore the construction sound, sorry. Uh, what we're going to do today is review breakout session two. This is our infrastructure and platting portion. So as you remember, Bob's Bistro has already done their pre-development conference. They got some high-level review comments on their conceptual plans. Um, and as most of you might know, before we go vertical, we got to go underground. So with that being said, I would like to bring uh, Mr. Drew Goodman with our IPRC Infrastructure Plan Interview Center. Yes, yes. Much obliged. How are y'all doing this afternoon? Good. Doing good. Wow, y'all are a lot more rowdy in the afternoon than in the mornings. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start this off talking about the Infrastructure uh, Plan Review Center. So, um, you know, if we're going back, which one is it? There we go. Yeah. All right, so when we're dealing with public infrastructure, we have a few options within the city that, you know, going back to Bob and his bistro, he can choose from. 
So we have ordinance tabs and our miscellaneous groups. Both of those are ran by a water department and we will have um, someone else be talking about those in a little bit, as well as our new SIPs program. But let's say Bob has reviewed all of those options and there's still some components of his public infrastructure that he needs to uh, get done. We have two options for him. One is our Express CFA, um, and our other one is our IPRC standard process. Uh, so looking at the Express CFA, so if Bob uh, thinks he can come through our Express CFA, we're gonna start him off with an eligibility meeting. So he's gonna reach out to us. He's gonna give us a worksheet as well as some information on his facility. And we're going to sit down with him and make sure that he meets all the criteria to come through an express CFA. So as you can see there, that includes no city participation, no major encroachments, no waivers to the subdivision ordinance, and no project scope greater than 800 feet. Uh, so if everything looks good there, that's great. We're going to set him up for a review. So our reviews for express CFAs come in on every Tuesday and there are five day business review. So from Tuesday to Tuesday, we're gonna be looking at those plans. We're also gonna be looking at the project manual and our CFA exhibits. That's part of Express. We're trying to get him in and out as quick as possible. So we're gonna be looking at everything all at once. On top of that, so Tuesday, those uh, comments, if there are any, are gonna be published to our Acela website. And there's gonna be two days for Bob and his engineering team to review those and get us revised plans. On that Thursday, we're gonna have a Express CFA conference where we're gonna sit down with uh, Bob and his engineering team, go through how they answered each one of those comments. The PM and the PRT members are gonna look at it and say, yes, I agree with that or no, but can we just adjust this? We're gonna go through that if Bob doesn't make it the first round, he'll make it that second round where we get him in, get him out. Um, and then from there, he's going to get approval on his plans. We've already reviewed the project manual and the CFA exhibit. So the next thing we're going to do is Bob's going to go and find him a contractor. Bob's going to get that contractor to give him prices, sign off that these are the prices he's going to do. We're going to make sure that those CFA exhibits don't need to change for any reason. Um, then we're going to get him over to get a community fa facilities agreement, get that executed. Finally, we're going to get down to that electronic documentation review. Uh, that's going to be our final look at the project manual, make sure our easements are in place, permits, bid proposal tools. So this is a tool that helps us make sure we understand all of the um, bid components. And we're also going to be looking at construction permits and SWIP checks. Once that's all done, Bob gets to go to pre-con, everybody's happy. Uh, let's say, unfortunately, Bob goes through that eligibility meeting and there's just some component. Uh, you know, one thing that we run into a lot is maybe there's uh, just a component of storm that wasn't seen before that's just too big for an express or city participation pops up and we need to look at that. That's okay, we have the IPRC process. Uh, our standard process is called Legacy. Uh, we moved to that in April of this year. I think many of y'all uh, know about Legacy. If not, there is a link to our website at the very end of this presentation that will take you to about a four hour presentation where you can learn anything and everything you want to. Um, so Legacy is gonna start with a mandatory pre-submittal review and conference. This is gonna be very similar to what we just talked about in the Expresses. So we're gonna sit down Tuesday by noon, you're going to make a submission with your plans. We're going to have five days to review those. On the Thursday after, we're going to look at those comments with you. So instead of having revisions by that Thursday, we're actually going to use that Thursday to sit down with the PM, the PR team member, and answer any of your questions there. Uh, for your pre submill you don't need to have your studies done. You don't need to have your alignment walk done, but it's very helpful. So if you wanna go ahead and do that, that's great. It brings you in. If not, there'll be comments on the plan saying you need this study, you need this alignment walk. You will need those before we get to our first review. Uh, so our first reviews are every Monday by 5 p.m. 
uh, and those reviews take 10 business days to look at. So we're gonna have 10 business days to get back to you with any comments. The first review, we're only looking at the plans. So you don't need to submit exhibits, project manuals, any of that fun stuff. We're gonna hold that to the compliance. Once you get through the first review, we're gonna move to our compliances. So you can see here in our compliance, it says 10 or five days. So the first compliance review, we're gonna take 10 days to review that, make sure everything's there. We're really trying to get everybody out on that R1 if we can. So we're taking that extra time, really looking at it. There is also some option time built into these of five business days. So if at the 10, we have some minor comments, we can reach back out to you and say, hey, if you can fix this in five days, we're gonna get you approval. If we know you can't, we're still gonna give you comments on that 10 day and say, come in when you can. The good thing about compliance reviews under legacy, any day, any time. You can submit any day or any time. With that said, if you are a go-getter, you wanna submit Saturday at 11.30, go and do it. We will look at it Monday morning. <laughs> Um, so once we get through our compliances, uh, which, sorry, the compliances, we're going to have that construction plans, the project manual, and the CFA exhibits, very similar to what we do in Express. We're trying to get you ramped up so that we can get through the CFA a lot quicker. Once that's done, we're going to get a cover sheet over, get that cover sheet signed, and then Bob is going to be following the path that you see here exactly the same as our Express. So really what Express does is it shortens the time of our reviews, gets you in and gets you out. The reason we can do that is they're much smaller scale projects. So if we look at our timelines, if you're looking at the Express, so uh, from the time that we get it, all the information for the eligibility meeting, it's typically three to five business days, you will have a meeting set up to go over everything. And then total business days on the city side is gonna be four to six weeks, depending on if you need to have an additional round of review or not. So you're looking at 20 to 30 business days to get through the process. Uh, standard process pre-submittal is a five business day plus that conference that we talked about. And then total business days, if you go through the approval and the first review is 35. So you can see we're right at the end cap of what you would typically see on the express. Uh, I will say Bob is probably going to be like most of the masses. You're just not going to make it that first round, and that's okay. If we have to do one compliance, that is 52 business days. So you can see the difference. If you can do Express, it's a wonderful option to save some time there. Uh, so if you have any questions on the processes, fees, or in general, this is our email address. So please feel free to email us at any time. Uh, the full calendar, all those presentations that we just talked about, as well as some general information, not just on IPRC, but infrastructure as a whole, can be found at this link. And that's all I've got. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. All right. Our next presenters are going to be over the Small Scale Infrastructure Program, also known as the SIP Program. I have Ms. Evelyn Roberts and Ms. Jenna Owens. Hi, good morning or good afternoon everyone. My name is Jenna Henderson. I am the program manager for the Small Scale Infrastructure Program, which is also called SIPS. Joining me today is Evelyn Roberts and she is a contract administrator. She oversees all of our contracts, so she's gonna be talking a little bit about that. I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about our Small Scale Infrastructure Program, but before I do that, there's a fundamental question that we have to answer. And that is, who is Bob and what type of a development experience does Bob want? If Bob is looking for simplification, then Bob's likely interested in a process we call Sipify and Simplify. Could everyone hear that? If not, Evelyn, what did I just say? Sipify and Simplify, right? But what exactly does Sipify and Simplify mean? It means for the first time, 
and development services, Bob can choose his development experience, his full development experience. So Bob can choose to have the city oversee the design and the construction of community facilities. And what I mean by that is this. Bob can essentially pick his process. So on the left-hand portion of this slide, we're calling that the you design and you build track. That's where Bob sends his plans to the infrastructure plan review committee, like Andrew just presented on, and then goes to the CFA process. On the other side of the screen right here, on the right side, he can choose to do a city design led a city-led design and construction process. Now, what that would look like is Bob would start off and he would go to water miscellaneous projects for any water and sewer taps. And Subi's gonna be presenting some details on that in a little bit. After, he can come to the small-scale infrastructure program. So within the small-scale infrastructure program, we would actually oversee the design and construction of community facilities like street lights, pedestrian lights, flat work such as driveway, apron, sidewalk, as well as alleys. To better help Bob determine what infrastructure process is better for him, we've came up with a couple questions. So Bob can ask himself, am I looking for convenience? Do I need a team of experts to, or, or do I want a team of experts to oversee my construction, or am I the expert? In the past, has it been challenging for me to secure bonded contractors? And do I have the time for a community facilities agreement? If Bob is finding that he's answering yes to a lot of these questions, he's probably wondering a little bit more detail about the small scale infrastructure program. So currently, the small scale infrastructure program, or SIP, can design and construct community facilities. Currently, we are designing street lights, pedestrian lights, and those are up to 800 linear feet of street and pedestrian lights, as well as driveway aprons, side, sidewalk, uh, alleys, and other incidental flat work. In the future, we're going to pro be providing more holistic experience to Bob, and we're gonna be also including water and sewer, as well as solar into our offerings. The timeline for that looks like this. Currently, we're installing, like I said, the street lights, the pedestrian lights, and the flat work. By spring of next year, we're gonna be piloting water and sewer in select areas, select markets. And next fall, we're going to be scaling to offer all infrastructure categories in the broader market. So fall of 2025 is when Bob could come to the small scale infrastructure program and have a very holistic experience where he comes to us and we design all the community facilities and we oversee the construction. Uh, in fall of 2026, we are hoping to offer in-house design services to also improve Bob's overall development experience. So let me quickly describe how simple our process is. Bob comes and fills out an application in a cella and pays the application fee of $1,687.50. Within two weeks, we give Bob a proposal for full design and construction cost. So Bob pays the application fee, it's non-refundable, and in two weeks, we give him a proposal for design and construction costs, right? Bob pays in full for the overall design and construction. So if Bob has a building permit and there's a hold on his building permit for community facilities, like a street light or a pedestrian light, Bob comes to us, we give him a proposal for the full design and construction cost. He pays in full and the building permit is, the hold on the building permit is released. So then Bob goes and pulls his building permit, right? And he goes out and he starts doing what he wants to do, which is construction. And all in the background as a parallel task, SIP is working on the community facilities. So that's when we start routing contracts, which is Evelyn's gonna touch on, and we also start doing the engineering design. Now, we oversee all aspects of the engineering design as well as 
plan review and approval. So the only time we really work with Bob is at 95% completion. We'll show him the plans and just make sure that he's in agreement with where we're proposing things need to be. At 100%, we also reach back out to him and we ask, we ask him to review the plans again and sign off on them. So it's a really streamlined turnkey approach. And again, Bob's already in construction, so he's very happy with, with how simple this approach is. After Bob approves 100% plans, we go into construction and we work with his contractor to identify the best timeline for him for us to go construct those community facilities. So what's happened in the past is we actually work with his contractor and we get a little, we get an understanding of their construction timeline. And I can tell you, this is so simple. The hardest thing is actually ensuring that the fence is not where we need to put a trench. So then we schedule our construction, Evelyn routes the construction task order, and we break ground. So Evelyn is also gonna be talking a little bit about the agreements that we need for, for Bob to execute. Thanks, Jenna. So Bob has made a decision that he just wants us to take care of everything for him. He wants to make it so simple. So there's a couple of agreements that we will be routing, um, and these are running parallel from the moment that Bob's uh, paid their application fee. One of the first contracts that we um, enter into is the engineering task order, and then um, we're going to enter into the hold harmless agreement, then we go into our owner contract and the construction task order. Um, in the past, I know that a lot of the projects that have gone through even Express CFA, you know, one of the delays is sometimes getting the developer to provide like financial guarantees for the CFAs. Um, going through our program simplifies that completely. I take care of everything for Bob, I the only thing that Bob needs to do is just watch out for an email that he gets from me and he just signs it and that's it. Yeah, so thank you all for listening. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the small scale infrastructure program or you have questions, again, my name is Jenna Henderson. I'll be passing out my business card and we thank you for listening today as we endeavor to improve the development experience for all. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna and Evelyn. All right. If Bob doesn't want to utilize the SIT program, we can do our standard CFA or contracts process. We have uh, Ms. Becca Owen here with our contract management office. Thank you. Which way am I going? This way? Okay, thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Rebecca Owen. I'm the manager of the contract management section here in Development Services. And I'm gonna to touch on the contracts that you will need uh, to begin the development process. So let's just uh, break out of the team. So what contracts may be necessary for Bob uh, building a bistro here in the city of Fort Worth? As you can see, we have a litany of potential contracts. So the community facilities agreement, which I know you guys have been hearing quite a bit about this afternoon, uh, just to clarify, the community facilities are the things you don't have to be a resident of the city of Fort Worth in order to enjoy these. You can drive on our streets. Doesn't matter if you're from the USA. You can go into the QT, wash your hands, all of those types of things, right? Go to the stop sign. So these are community facilities. And what we do is we guarantee the construction of these with a financial guarantee. And then we have our easements that you can do by a separate instrument. This is dedication, abandonment, and vacation, this is not part of the platting process, so this is gonna be things outside of the platted boundary. Things like that, the encroachments, maintenance agreements, stormwater facility maintenance agreements, and unified sign. So for the CFA, we are going to secure, like I said, the construction of the improvement with a financial guarantee, which are listed right over here. These all have different requirements and things of that nature, which we'll walk through whenever you get to that stage, but this is going to ensure you um, to move forward in the process. You're gonna be able to get to construction quick, you know, once you get this executed. A lot of the times this will release your plat hold, things of that nature. I've also listed out the new application fee, so our fees do increase starting tomorrow. So for quick reference, because I know this is all very, very fast, I went ahead and printed out all of our different agreements with the new fees and things. I'll put them over here for you guys and some business cards. So if you have any questions, you guys can just shoot me an email and I'll make sure and respond to you quickly. 
uh, for our easement. So let's say in the community facilities with your IPRC plan set, you are going to be extending a water line or something of that nature. You need to be able to convey um, that water line with an easement, right? And so let's say it's either just a portion of that, you're not gonna go through the replatting process type of thing. We can do that by separate instrument with our land agents. Uh, with the encroachment. So let's say that Bob for his bistro, he would like to add uh, large flower boxes and things of that nature in the right of way. We can absolutely secure an encroachment agreement and realize that vision. Uh, we will just need to get certain you know, things from you. We're gonna review uh, exhibits, get meets and bounds, certificate of insurance, and get that executed so that it will release the hold and again, keep you, keep you moving. Now for the maintenance agreements, this is for non-standard infrastructure. So this is called out by zoning. So let's consider in this example, we have some kind of pretty street lights. So one of the hot topics right now is solar lights. Big deal, right? People really want to go into this new type of thing, but it's not standard. The city doesn't have a contract to be able to maintain that. So in order to realize your vision of what you want to see, we can absolutely do a maintenance agreement, which means the city owns it, but you maintain it because the city has no way to maintain it without that contract. So until that is adopted as a uh, common um, standard product of the city of Fort Worth that we can maintain, we will just do a maintenance agreement. Like I said, put that responsibility back on whomever wants to be the maintainer of that infrastructure. Stormwater facility maintenance agreements. So obviously Bob's Bistro construction could possibly impact the drainage of the surrounding areas. And so there's, you know, various mechanisms in place that our SDS group is going to kind of call out and require things of that nature. So again, same same type of premise as the maintenance agreements we're going to go through and uh, make sure that we have uh, security to be able to put the ownership or not the ownership, the ownership will be kind of negotiated, but the maintenance requirement will be back on the person executing that agreement. And so we'll be um, obtaining things such as like signature authority, things like that. These are the things that commonly hold up the process. And so like, again, went ahead and listed those out for you guys, just so that you have that to be able to be prepared for whenever it is time to execute your agreements. Oh, well, that was it. All right. Thank you, Becca. All right. Uh, one of the other important roles in the infrastructure and civil development is going to be platting. I have Mr. Derek Hull. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon. So as you all see, Bob is well on his way. Um, but before he gets too far in the process, he has to plat. You guys understand when we talk about platting what that process is. So we'll go through a couple of slides. So for this illustration, Bob is looking to submit um, to build a bistro. And in this example, he's looking at a minor final plat. This typically means four lots or less. Um, and so um, what's really critical here is that if the plat illustrates a lot of area where public areas and easements exist, um, if the plat will ensure adequate public facilities for streets, utilities, stormwater, management, fire protection, and safety, um, he can kind of go through what we call a more simplified process. Um, as I'm giving this presentation, I see one of my commissioners of um, our city plan commission, and so he will certainly appreciate this discussion. But as it relates to qualifying for a minor final plat, uh, again, it includes four lots, four or fewer lots, uh, direct access to an existing street, and no new street dedication, as well as the lots meeting the zoning district requirements. So simultaneous to this presentation, we also have a, a meeting that's talking about development standards relating to zoning. What you generally need to know is there are minimum um, widths of lots that are approved administratively. Anything that goes less than what the minimum lot, for instance, uh, will require uh, a application and a submission to city plan commission. But in this case, uh, Bob meets the minimum uh, with requirements um, of a minor final plat. Um, some other zoning requirements may be if the uh, plat is located on what we consider a long block, 
or if it's located um, on two sides of a thoroughfare, so having multiple access points to a particular plat, this might necessitate a visit to the City Plan Commission. But in this case, as you can see with this illustration, uh, this is a mid-block uh, location for where the uh, bistro is going to be located, uh, and it's located on a main thoroughfare. Therefore, this will be approved administratively. Um, and so, when we're talking about different types of plats, uh, we have a multiple, uh, a multitude of plats that you can consider. Concept plan is typically anything that's one acre or more. Uh, preliminary plat, as I mentioned, which will ultimately be recorded as a final plat. Uh, but then there's also the minor final plat. Uh, so as you can imagine, we have plats that are um, five lots or greater. And so that would not, con that would not constitute um, a minor final plat, but would be a final plat, uh, the beginning stages being a preliminary plat. But then there's also a replat. So you might have a recorded plat already. You're doing some reconfigurations of the plat. You might have to uh, put in some new easements or dedications. And so it's important for you to have to go back and take an approved plat and have it replatted. Um, our team and planning and annexation are there to guide you through the process. So as it relates to Bob, what else is Bob submitting with his minor final plat application? Well, as you can see from the illustrations, um, and obviously once when he submits, Bob submits the exhibits, the fees, the fee waiver. And again, that, that waiver is if, there, if there's any deviation from any zoning uh, requirement, zoning development standard. If all that's been submitted, uh, all requirements of zoning are achieved, the following studies have been approved if they are applicable. So a drainage study, a traffic study in some cases, water sewer studies. If all of these things have been submitted and, and or they are approved, uh, then we can potentially approve the final short plat or the final plat um, administratively, which means it doesn't have to go out for a public notice. We do this in house. Um, and we do so by transmitting through a CELA uh, the case file to all of the reviewing departments. They will then uh, provide their um, comments and or recommendations, um, and then we can um, approve it, assuming again that there are no waivers that are required. Now, per chapter, uh, what is that? 212 of the Texas Local Government Code, the plat shall be approved, approved with conditions or disapproved within 30 days. So we have a calendar. Um, and in the planning, the planning um, and annexation division, what we do is we accept applications twice a month. So we have what we call um, an intake period. And then you can imagine every 14 days we are accepting applications and then we close the window. If you get in your application with the exhibits, with the fees, um, and if you have submitted or in the process of submitting all of your studies, we can uh, get it administratively approved and have it done within 30 days. If it has to go to City Plan Commission, we can still make sure that you can get uh, your plat approved, but it's, it's critical and it's important that you look at a seller and look at the comments that are being offered from other departments. So if there are some, um, some items that need to be addressed before we can actually take it to City Plan Commission and get an approval, we have to make sure that you address those comments. And above all, we have to make sure that all the fees are paid. But our goal is always to try and get both those administratively approved plats and those that have to go to City Plan Commission, um, make sure that those plats are approved within 30 days. Now you notice in my presentation, I did not mention city council. That is because with the platting process in the city of Fort Worth, your plat does not have to go to city council for approval. So that cuts down tremendously on the staff. Now there is a possibility, if you do not like the decision, uh, let's say of um, the director, you probably met DJ at some point, mm -hmm. And, and or his staff, which would be me and other members of the Development Services Department, um, and or the City Plan Commission. As applicants, if you don't like that decision, you can always appeal, um, and the next hearing body would be to uh, City Council. Um, I'm happy to say that since I've been here, we haven't had any appeals, 
we typically work with our applicants to get through the process. So what does Bob do after his final plat is approved? And this is really the critical part. The community facilities agreement, which you've heard a little bit about earlier today, needs to be executed before Bob can get his plat recorded. We do require, after you go through this process, to record your plat. Uh, and in this case, Bob is in Tarrant County, we assume. Um, and so you need to record it with the county and then provide the city with a copy of the recorded plat. This is gonna be critical because once when you pull building permits, you will need to show the building department that you actually have a recorded and approved plat. Um, Bob can record with the county and submit copies to the planning office. No building permit for any construction activity shall be issued by the city until the plat is filed and recorded. So there you have it. Bob is well on his way. He's ready to start construction. Um, and so we're gonna bring up the next person. Thanks. All right, thank you, Mr. Hull. Let's take a quick step back um, in Drew's presentation and also Mr. Hull's presentation. You heard the references of water studies, sewer studies, drainage studies. Um, we're gonna hear from those three sections now and then we will conclude the meeting. So let's keep it going with Stormwater. I have Mr. Leon Wilson. Thank you, good afternoon. My name's Leon Wilson I'm with the Stormwater Development Services. And as Derek mentioned, one of the three studies you need is a stormwater study in addition to the traffic and the wastewater and water study. And our study is the funner study that everyone loves. So, so Bob's site is 1.5 acres. He needs a study because part of our criteria, anything larger than one acre needs to follow, have a drainage study and follow the 2024 drainage uh, manual, which was up. It was updated in July 15th of this year. Bob needs to also demonstrate no adverse impacts in accordance with that manual. And one of the new criteria we have is for before you can submit the initial drainage study, you must schedule a stormwater PDC. For the first couple of months, we kind of were lenient on that. And I've asked the guys now on the initial submittal, hold it as incomplete until you have that stormwater PDC so we can talk about your site. And that meeting includes internal staff, our reviewers, and if it has floodplain, it'll have the floodplain staff as well from TPW. And those meetings can be requested. Um, all our correspondence goes through SDS at forestexas.gov. So some of the potential adverse impacts Bob needs to look at. No new or increased flooding. So even if there is flooding, uh, he can't increase above 0.00. .00. And he also needs to look at the downstream system, the right-of-way capacity, detention may be necessary. And as Becca mentioned, if detention is necessary, he's gonna need a SWIFMA, a stormwater facility maintenance agreement. And also if he's draining to outlet, if his drains into an existing channel, uh, he can't have velocities over six feet or if the existing velocities are already over six feet, he gets a 5% increase, but that's it. So if he has a, if it's 10 feet per second, he's bounded by 10.5 feet per second. And obviously, if he's in a FEMA floodplain, he, there are additional requirements, flood studies, flood development permits. So as Derek mentioned, he needs to study approved prior to final plat approval. So after Bob has his drainage study approval, and sometimes they run concurrently, but Bob also needs a grading permit prior to building permit. So if Bob submits his drainage study and also submits a grading permit, one of the comments would be, you need an accepted drainage study. But we still will make comments on the grading permit, but the hold will, st will stand until that drainage study is accepted. Sometimes if Bob wants to clear and grub, he can get an early grading permit, but no infrastructure is allowed, no excavation for utilities, detention ponds. Essentially, he can just clear the land. He still would need to have his um, urban forestry permit, his SWIP, and the drainage study would need to be far, uh, far enough along that we're comfortable with allowing him the early grade. And he can't change the patterns, the drainage patterns. So once he gets his final grading permit, from SDS, uh, from our, as far as our holes, he can go vertical. Um, obviously, he has other building permit holes to address. 
So Bob's grading plan that's included in his grading permit, much, much, uh, it should match the drainage study. And that's one of the things SDS checks on the grading permit. So essentially, if his site drains this way and he decides, and that's in the study, it drains that direction, and then we get a grading permit and it drains, you know, this way, he either has to revise the study or revise that grading permit to match the study. Minor, minor changes we can work through on the grading permit, but significant ones we have to generally change the study or you change the grading permit. So during the review SDS, we look at the study, the drainage patterns, we check for encroachment, urban forestry checks for phase one, you have to have the phase one permit um, approved before you can get the per, uh, grading permit. Water department checks for cover, uh, actually not just cover, cover and cut on their existing infrastructure, and they also check for encroachments across their lines. Uh, parks, the Park and Rec Department only will comment if you are affecting trees in the right of way, and gas well will only uh, make comment if you're in proximity of a gas well. And both the drainage study and the early, per, uh, the grading permit, we have a 10-day uh, business day turnaround. And I think that's it. Thank you, Leon. Let's go to transportation development. I have Mr. Kane and Henry. Thank you, I'm Ken and Henry. I'm a Senior Capital Projects Officer in Development Services. I'm over actual transportation and stormwater. And so the question is, what does Bob need to provide for his bistro? So Bob needs to provide us a copy of the, of the plat, as Derek mentioned earlier. And in some cases, we need a site plan to, uh, for us to determine the, the access and the circulation and land use intensity. And as Bob submits this information, staff will be able to determine the development is in line with our transportation engineering manual our asset management policy, or if a tra traffic a impact analysis is required. So we look at it and say, is the bistro in line with our asset management policy? We're looking at uh, spacing of driveways, turn lanes, in respects to property. If it's in line with our transportation engineering manual, we're looking at pe pedestrian accommodations such as sidewalk, street lighting, driveway dimensions, and a traffic impact analysis. What determines whether Bob needs a traffic impact analysis. So we have a TIA worksheet that we're gonna ask the applicants to complete to determine if their traffic generates enough uh, impact for a threshold to require of a, of a TIA. And there's other special circumstance, circumstances such as sensitive neighborhoods. So just telling the applicant, what is a tra traffic impact analysis? It's an engineering study that analyzes the given intersection, including driveways and roadways, to determine if a development will impact the transportation system. Uh, primarily, we're focused on analyzing the existing transportation system in the capacity, system's capacity in contrast with the chip gen generation from the proposed development in the peak time periods, in which typically seven to nine and four to six. So if Bob Bistro requires a TIA, we're gonna say, Bob, you need to hire a licensed traffic engineer. That's important, a licensed traffic engineer to perform the TIA. Once the TIA is complete, we're gonna ask the engineer to submit the TIA via our seller platform, which we'll review and approve. Nothing. Thank you, Cannon. How's everybody feeling? Do we need a stretch? We need a dance break? <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to urban forestry and I have Ms. Jacqueline Inger. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I know you already went through, your, or Bob went through his PDC. Um, there are trees on site. So before, or according to our urban forestry ordinance, before there is any platting activity, before there is any development activity period on site, um, Bob needs to come through urban forestry. So, oh, it says presented by Mary. Okay, so again, like I said, since Bob needs to remove a tree and he will need a building permit, he'll have to come through urban forestry. Um, Bob will be applying for an urban forestry permit 
which is split into two phases for us. So our phase one is going, oh, we'll cover those in the next slide. <laughs> I'm winging this right now. Uh, the application for the urban forestry permit can be found on our landing page. So development departments, development services, zoning, urban forestry. It's honestly the easiest way to find urban forestry is to search for us on the city website. It's very hard to get to. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, as of today, Bob will pay $250 application fee. Tomorrow, it will be 268 to something, to 12.5% increase. <laughs> so um, they're updating that as we speak. Um, so those will be submitted in a CELA, and this fee will cover both phase one and phase two. And again, that's a base fee, so that's based on five acres. Anything over that, there's additional fees. So for our forestry phase one, this is going to be a plan that includes all of your existing tree canopy and the existing site conditions. So this will show which trees are on site, what trees you are proposing to remove, and um, any significant trees. Uh, currently, the way our canopy is done, it's based on canopy coverage, so it's square footage. Um, and so you are going to have any trees over six inches in diameter at breast height, so four and a half feet off the ground, um, and that is all species. Uh, so our protected trees, it's again going to be all species, and you're going to have to pr preserve 25% of the existing canopy. Um, significant trees, so trees over 27 inches, for most species all across the city. And if we are east of I-35, 18 inches for our post oaks and our blackjack oaks, which are just slow growing oaks that are in our cross timbers. Um, again, that's all kind of called out by your reviewer um, and is all spelled out in our very long application process. Um, so that's going to be your phase one. Your phase one will have to be approved. You would have to do a pre-grade inspection to have that tree protective fencing in before you can get your grading permit. So your phase two. Um, your phase two is going to be your proposed build. So those trees that you are preserving, those buildings that you are putting in, so for Bob, that one uh, bistro and the vacant site, or vacant retail space, I think it is. Um, and then also it would have to provide or provide us the provided canopy. So our tree ordinance is based on land use. So there's a 40% 40 40 coverage for all parking, 30% for commercial, um, which is what Bob is going to have, which is a commercial development. And then, so that's going to be the build out. So that can be provided based on trees that are preserved and then also planted. So that's where we kind of cover um, how you can provide that canopy with new plantings, large species, give you a credit of 2,000 square feet per three inch caliper, so little tree going in, medium species are 700 square feet per planting and small species are 100 square feet per planting. Um, again, with urban forestry, it's best to just reach out to us. Um, every single site is different uh, and we are one of the few that touches everything. Uh, Once you get through our process, once you've worked with our reviewers, you'll get stamped plans. So that stamped phase one is going to be provided for your grading permits. Those grading permits, we will then review the grading plan set, make sure that that grading is in line with our fa approved phase one so that you can have that grading. Um, we also do our pre-grade inspection before we provide that stamped plan because that's the only place that we can keep that. And then 
your phase twos, once those are stamped and approved, your phase ones and phase twos are both provided in your complete plan set for your building plan or building permit. That's it. That's us. Great job, Jacqueline. All right, let's go to the star of the show. We have water and wastewater with Mr. Subi Varghese. Yeah. Hey, good afternoon, all of you. My name is Subi Varghese. I'm managing uh, Development Services Water Section. Let's talk about uh, water and sewer connection for the Bristol's development. Oops. Hmm? It's getting a workout. Oh. Yeah. So how does Bob get water and sewer uh, to his site? Bob has three options. So he can apply through uh, uh, ordinance staffs. And the second option, apply through uh, in-house design group. And the third option is IPRC process including Express CFA. So what is ordinance tabs? Ordinance tab, it's a service tab installed by a field operations, uh, water department's field operations. And this uh, uh, include the tab size, two inches and uh, smaller, and sewer tabs uh, size, eight inches and smaller. And uh, field operations will not do uh, service tops deeper than 18, 8 foot. And uh, is there any major uh, gas line conflict, sewer line conflict, and they cannot do it. And uh, any new uh, payment card, field options cannot do it. So at that time, Bob need to apply through miscellaneous project or uh, CFA, uh, IPRC process. How can Bob find what fees are associated with the new services? All tap and impact fees, uh, it's available in our website, or Bob can contact uh, water applications team at 817-392-8250. How Bob can request an ordinance sewer or water taps? Bob can upload all the utility plans and uh, recorded plat in the building, uh, building uh, sorry, Accela permit and uh, See what type size you need, uh, would need to propose. And the uh, water applications team will uh, invoice the tap and impact fees. How soon Bob can expect the water and sewer service line to be installed? After all the fees paid, uh, Bob will be instructed to uh, locate the service tap connection required, but uh, green color with silver taps, uh, green sticks with the silver taps, and blue sticks with uh, uh, water taps. And it will take two to four weeks, depends on the uh, workload and the weather conditions. And here is the current fee schedule for the tap and impact fees. It's based on the tap size. It will be available uh, in our website. In-house design services. In-house design services are water departments, in-house group uh, doing the design work and the construction work. Uh, we have a third party contract. And uh, 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 what does Bob need to submit a miscellaneous project? He, uh, Bob need to submit uh, a utility, site utility plan. Uh, and uh, some, some cases he need to uh, provide MVP calculations, grading plans, and uh, 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 water sewer analysis. Depends on the what type of development Bob need. Small projects, you don't need to do any water sewer study, but he need to provide water uh, demand and sewer loading calculations. How can Bob apply for miscellaneous project? Bob can apply online uh, through the uh, Axela Citizens under water tab and all applications, uh, applicable plans, uh, documents should be uh, submitted 
to avoid any delays. How will Bob know when the cost estimates and the design have been completed? Bob will be notified through email uh, the cost estimate, design cost estimate, and the construction cost estimate. And he can log into uh, Excel account and he can pay the uh, all the fees and the cost. When Bob will project when Bob's project begin construction. Once all the fees paid, he, Bob, will, Bob will be notified the estimate, uh, estimate of construction time. Next, next process is IPRC projects. Bob need to hire a registered professional engineer who knows the uh, Fort Worth design, design criteria and policies, also TCEQ requirements, and uh, our design criteria is available in our website. Uh, Bob's engineer need to submit a water demand and uh, sewer loading calculations and a comprehensive water study. And uh, Bob's engineer also need to determine whether the business requires grease trap. All the grease trap information is available in our website. What is water and sewer study? A study will demonstrate whether the existing system can support uh, Bob's development. A study also shows uh, developer responsibilities for the system improvements. And the study shows the, uh, the uh, water uh, pipe size, slope, everything. And what sewer study are uh, submitted to WPD at Fort Worth, Texas, GOV. And sometimes alignment work required depends on uh, what size uh, water sewer line extension required or what type of uh, uh, water sewer uh, cap, uh, size pipe required or it's under the pavement or not, then depends on that uh, uh, alignment work required. Any alignment related questions, both can contact WPD at Fort Worth, Texas, sorry, uh, DSWS at Fort Worth, Texas .gov. Bob needs study to be approved before his engineer can submit IPRC plans. All the IPRC plans, uh, how to apply for the IPRC plans, I think uh, Drew already explained how to apply for the IPRC plans. Thank you. All right, friends. That concludes all of our presentations for today, but we do still have a few minutes left. Does anyone have any questions for staff and our presenters from today? Not that you ask questions when I get to yeah. my phone. So I'm gonna, yes. I'm gonna don't try to speak with our oh, no, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm not gonna try to do that. All right, thank you. There you go. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Um, my name's Rob. I had a question um, about the SIT program. Uh, they mentioned going up to 800 linear feet of streetlights. Are there any other limits on sidewalk or flat work or anything like that? Yeah, we actually- Hold on, I'm coming. This is so fun, <laughs> thank you. How fun. Okay, yes. Uh, so on a case by case basis, if it's one infrastructure item, we're willing to go up to 1600 feet. So, I mean, those are our approximate limits, but you know, we just, we're willing to work with different people. So if it makes sense to go through the program, like if it's a small development, um, less than an acre, it isn't in tech stock right away. It doesn't have city cost participation and it makes sense to go through us. We're more than willing to look at that project. So on a case by case basis, our limits are up to 1800 feet. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? No, oh, thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Edgar Ramirez, and uh, I've got a question regarding uh, planning. Uh, there's a provision that I keep running into in new construction where you can't utilities can't cross interior lot lines, um, and I'm trying to understand what drives that. Speak with. So the question is related to platting. Utilities can't cross into the interior so, lot lines. Yeah. So if the property is divided into three different lots, right? 
Yes. There's interior lot lines. And so utilities cannot cross those interior lot lines. You have to, you have to go in through one side into the building. At that point, utilities can cross through the building, but they can't cross on the outside. Correct. And it seems to be a thing. Uh, so I'm not sure what's driving that. Um, some of it will be depending upon if the units are um, being sold individually. Um, so it kind of depends upon the nature of the construction that you're doing. I'm assuming you're speaking of residential development. Uh, commercial. Or commercial. Mm -hmm. That's something that we'll probably need to look at. Um, uh, there, I can understand and I can see some instances where we would allow it, but we need to see kind of the specific situations that you're referring to in order to kind of address your issues. So okay. I have my cards, but let me make sure you get a card. And then if you want to follow up with me, I can um, respond a little bit later on. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name's Haley. Um, I have a question as far as traffic impact goes, not necessarily permanent traffic impact, but if we need to close down a road in order to develop shared infrastructure, um, what department or group does that fall under? So Kaylee? Haley, yeah. Okay. So you're asking about construction and closing down a road. So our assets are are maintained by our transportation public works. So we have a group in transportation public works that actually does the closures in any traffic control plans approval. Okay. Yes. Sorry. No, that's any other questions? <laughs> All right. Okay. Don't forget to take the survey, everybody. It's on your handout. If you don't like paper, it's right here as well. That concludes our seminar for today. As a friendly reminder, we're going to be doing these um, quarterly starting next year. So your survey results and your answers are going to help us tailor our seminars to you. We need, need to know what we can do better, what we need to dial back on, any other subjects that can probably be beneficial to your developments, okay? I do thank everyone for your time, and I hope you all have a great day. Have a great day.